peaking temperatures for poultry <clears throat> is 165 degrees. The reason it is the highest of all my cooking temperatures is because poultry for all of our proteins has more bacteria than any of the other proteins and more variety of bacteria. So we're cooking it to the highest of my cooking temperatures, which is 165, which means in a refrigerator or a freezer, we wanna store on the very bottom shelf. My next biggest, baddest defender is going to be my ground beef, which is what this picture represents, but also ground fish, whether it's ground for um, fish tacos or fish cakes or whatever. But this is based again on my cooking temperature. My ground meat or fish, we would cook 255. My middle shelf here in a refrigerator would be any type of raw meat. So beef, pork, veal, lamb, we cook to 145. All seafood is cooked to 145. I will explain why these have this specific storage order. And then the very top here, I have a salad that represents any type of ready to eat foods. So this could be a salad, it could be your yogurt parfait. Um, sometimes I see people store bread in a refrigerator, um, cut carrots, whatever, ready to eat foods. So my chicken on the bottom, 165. My ground meats or fish, 155. The whole meat and whole fish, these are both cooked to 145. And I often get the question, well, why does the seafood have to be above the meat if we have the same temperatures? It has to do with bacterial load. Generally speaking, seafood has a lower bacterial load than my whole meat. So this is why we store items in the refrigerator or freezer in this manner. Um, let me move on. So another way that we prevent cross-contamination, and this is an obvious one to me, is we need to make sure that we are washing our hands and changing our gloves frequently. Um, it's also important that and required that you wash your hands before putting on a new pair of gloves. And each time your gloves become contaminated, they become torn, you are, I, I see this all the time. Yesterday I was doing an inspection studying people come in and out of the kitchen wearing their gloves, opening and shutting the door. So making sure that those gloved hands are cleaned and the gloves are changed. I don't know if anybody noticed from this photo, but the gloves are too large on this person. <laughs> so I do acknowledge that this is the best picture I had, but um, important when you are getting gloves for your staff is to make sure that people have proper fitting gloves. If they're too small, it's hard to get on. Um, they're ripping the gloves. If they're too big, they feel kind of like Mickey Mouse gloves and they become unsafe when people are using knives and other equipment. Um, another way that we wanna prevent cross-contamination is to keep foods in our refrigerators and freezers covered and or wrapped. And I'm not sure how well you can see this picture, but this is basically showing some hotel pans, some camera containers with the covers or the food wrap on top. And another question that I often get is, why do we have to cover it in the refrigerator? It's not out in the open. Um, it's not like in a, you know, in a prep table where people are walking by or there's other activities, even in a walk-in refrigerator or freezer. Go in and take a look at your fan guards. I would say 90% of the time there's a bunch of dust and particles on it. And the minute the fan goes on, it's going to they're going to become dislodged and can easily end up getting into the food. So you want to make sure that food is always covered in your refrigerators or freezers. Um, other ways that we would prevent cross-contamination, um, and these are um, important but not as critical as um, the proper storage or the cleaning and sanitizing of the cutting board, but food always have to, has to be stored off the floor by at least six inches. You don't want to store any food or equipment under any sinks. Under hand sinks, prep sinks, three base sinks, those sinks can often leak and that dirty water can get into the food or equipment contaminating it. But you always need to store food and equipment or chemicals completely separately. And there's been a lot of situations where chemicals have inadvertently gotten into food or recently I actually saw um, somebody with a chemical spray bottle with a disinfectant in it which became a chemical that we started using during COVID that was stored with a nozzle over the ice bin at the bar and some of the ice became contaminated with the disinfectant. And then we need to make sure that all of our personal drinks and food is stored um, away from all food and equipment that we use with our customers and it is covered to prevent contamination. 
So personal hygiene, another big risk factor. And I'll go in, my slides are going to be a little different from what I say right now. The three big critical things that I always stress is that number one is you do not want employees coming into work when they're sick. And I think this was really stressed and highlighted during the COVID pandemic. So don't come into work when you're sick. And I'll talk about some specific symptoms. Always wash hands, wash hands, wash hands, wash hands, wash hands. That's one of the most important things when it comes to hygiene. And a third critical component is that employees do not have bare hand contact with ready to eat food. Those three components will really help prevent the spread of viruses. And something that I didn't mention at the beginning of this is when I started teaching food safety classes 25 plus years ago, viruses represented about 15% of all illnesses and outbreaks. Now they represent about 70%, seven zero. The reason I bring this up at this point is viruses are so difficult to deal with, much more so than bacteria. They are not killed by normal cooking temperatures and they are usually spread by poor personal hygiene. So if somebody's working when they're ill, if they have the virus on their hands, if they're not washing their hands or wearing gloves, it spreads easily. So <clears throat> personal hygiene, it's critical to wash hands. It is critical to wash hands to prevent foodborne illness. And some of the big changes in the food code, and I'm circling on this slide, was the water temperature and the length of time that you actually scrub your hands. So when we changed the food code in the fall of 2018, um, the water temperature dropped to 100 degrees. That is just two or three degrees above our body temperature. So we're gonna refer to this as warm water. Use warm water, you have to use soap. Um, old code, some of you probably remember the big, you know, scrub your hands for 20 seconds. Um, really 10 to 15 okay. seconds is what the requirement is. Um, and then, it is also equally important. <laughs> Can you all hear baby on here or is that just me? I will keep going. So it's very important that we dry our hands thoroughly after washing our hands. And in terms of when washing our hands, we need to wash our hands when we first come into the kitchen or into the prep area, after we use the restroom, um, after we have a cigarette break, after we take a lunch break, after we handle raw food, we take out the trash, we handle chemicals, anytime our hands become contaminated, they have to be washed. And that's pretty much a constant all day long. And my slides are kind of acting funny here. So where do we wash our hands? The only place we are allowed to wash our hands is in a hand washing sink. A hand washing sink is going to be properly stocked with paper towels. It's gonna have soap. You need to have hot running water. Um, you have the little signs, employees must wash their hands. This is the only place I have seen employees wash their hands in the three base sink or pot sink, whatever you wanna call it, when there's still um, dishes or equipment being washed and sanitized can't wash in the prep sink. You don't ever wanna block a hand sink or use it for any other purpose. And one of the things that I see often, somebody's using a knife um, or tongs, they drop it on the floor, they quickly rinse it off into a hand sink. Two problems with this. Problem number one, this hand sink is now being obstructed if somebody's using it to clean utensils. But the second thing, when we wash our hands at this hand sink, we have dirty, soapy water. Maybe we've been handling raw hamburgers. All the bacteria and dirt and soap are down in the sink. When we put the, the knife or the tongs in the sink to rinse it off, any of the debris from the sink can splash up, contaminating the equipment. So you don't want to use that sink for any other purpose than hand washing. Another big component, no bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. And I think of this as two separate parts. When I say no bare hand contact, that means absolutely no bare hand contact. Whole hands, little finger, any type of contact with a ready to eat food can easily transmit these viruses. And then when I say ready to eat foods, my dog is barking. I do apologize. <laughs> Hold a moment, please. Actually, I'll keep talking. He's pretty quiet. 
So another requirement, when I say no bare hand contact, I just talked about that with ready to eat foods. Ready to eat foods are foods that require no cooking, no further cooking or no further washing before it's consumed. So this is literally foods that are ready to eat. And I'm going to jump out here for just a second. I hope everyone's enjoying the presentation so far. We're good. Lisa's coming back. This is very funny. Welcome to Zoom world, guys. <laughs> Anybody remember the attorney or politician that turned into like a mouse or something when they were doing? Very funny. I will resume. I do apologize. I had to get the dog out of the room. So no bare hand contact, ready to eat foods. Um, I mentioned the three critical components for preventing the transmission of viruses, and this is the third. So no bare hand contact, washing hands, and then I'm going to talk about not working while somebody's sick. But other generic requirements when it comes to personal hygiene is employees must be wearing hair restraints. I don't care. In, in my mind, whatever your corporate standards is one thing, but whatever it is that they're wearing, if it's a baseball cap and then their hair is tied back with a ponytail, it could be a hairnet, it could be a bandana that restrains all the hair. Um, also, beards are considered hair that must be restrained. So a beard caught um, in COVID world, actually, the masks work really, really well as a beard restraint for some people, but employees may not be wearing any jewelry pretty much from elbows down. So a simple metal band, band uh, like a wedding band is acceptable, but no watches. I see people wearing their watches, their Fitbit, their um, friendship bracelets. So everything has to be removed basically from the elbows down. You need to make sure that all your employees are bathing daily. Um, I have had discussions with some of the PICs in my classes about what they have to do or conversations they've had to have with employees who are not bathing. Very awkward. Um, but employees cannot be eating, drinking, smoking, chewing gum, or tobacco in any food prep areas, food storage areas, or equipment storage areas. So these are all important to prevent transmission of these diseases as well. <clears throat> this is a critical component. <clears throat> Do not allow anybody to work while they're sick. And I, everybody needs to be familiar with these symptoms. Employees who are sick, and I'm speaking slowly, very deliberately, if they have vomiting, if they have diarrhea, if they have fever with a sore throat, or if they have jaundice, they may not be working with food. The most critical ones would be vomiting, and I'm highlighting this right here, vomiting, diarrhea, and the third one is jaundice. If you don't know what jaundice is, this is yellowing of the skin and the eyes. It can happen for a variety of reasons, but in the restaurant industry, if somebody has jaundice, worst case scenario is it's hepatitis A. If somebody has jaundice, this is reportable to the health department immediately. So you call Diana, say somebody's got jaundice. And if it's at seven o'clock at night, you leave a message. So she gets that message first thing in the morning. But vomiting and diarrhea, if somebody has vomiting or diarrhea, this is, these are conditions that can absolutely spread like a wildfire if they come into work. Even if people are washing their hands really well and they are wearing gloves, if this is some bacteria, take very few bacterial cells to make somebody sick. If it's a viral foodborne illness, these are transmitted like wildfire and it's too risky to have them come in. Um, employees also need to report to the PIC, which is you, the person in charge, any information about health and activities as they relate to disease transmittable through food. Basically what this means, if you are living in or working in an environment where there's an outbreak of a foodborne illness occurring, this does need to be reported because again, these diseases are very contagious. So they, they're not always acquired by ingesting contaminated food. You can also get them like in a household. If somebody has salmonella or norovirus or hepatitis A, it can spread to the other household members easily. And I am guessing slash hoping that all of you have um, what we call a food employee reporting agreement. <clears throat> and this is literally a copy and paste from the food code. Um, I have copies of this. I know Diana has copies of this. If you don't, 
but this is the agreement between you and any of your employees that they will not be working while they're sick. And it does specifically highlight the, the symptoms that I just talked about, the diarrhea, the vomiting, the jaundice, fever with sore throat, if they have infected wounds that have um, lesions on their hands or pus, these have to be reported to you. And then if an employee is diagnosed with a foodborne illness, there's six big ones that we're most concerned about and then about 20 others that I'm not gonna bore you with. But if somebody's diagnosed with a foodborne illness, um, they need to report this to you. You need to report it to the health department so it can be investigated. And you don't want to ignore your health inspector. I'm gonna have a little push for Diana here. Um, if you don't report, you will be in trouble. If you do report, this is, this is a good thing. People get sick. People have symptoms of a foodborne illness. Ignoring it or trying to um, hide it is, is going to make things worse. So call the health department and say, hey, we got a problem here. Diana, whoever answers the phone, will work with you guys. And this is your worst nightmare, basically, when something like this happens. So another big risk factor would be improper cleaning and sanitizing. So this is the last of the, the four that occur while we're working. So cleaning and sanitizing, they, they are very different processes. And I want to define the two. Cleaning is the process of removing the visible or tangible debris. And really everything in your establishments need to be cleaned. So floors, walls, ceilings, prep tables, refrigerators, slicers, can openers, trash cans, um, floor drains, everything needs to be cleaned. So free of visible or tangible debris and sanitizing, this is reserved for food contact surfaces. And this is killing 99.999% of those microorganisms. So it could be the bacteria like salmonella or E. coli or listeria. All food contact surfaces, cutting boards, slicers, utensils have to be both cleaned and sanitized. What we do at home is very different than what is required in the restaurants. So cleaning and sanitizing, one of the um, big changes when we adopted the newer edition of the food code, so three years ago when we changed our food code, is the requirement to have both soap and sanitizing solutions available. Um, you all probably realize that for years you've had the red bucket set up or you've had the sanitizing spray bottle set up, but now you really need to have um, soap solutions and sanitizing solutions available during all hours of preparation. And getting employees to remember this, a lot of times I get people um, or have had people mix up these buckets. So if you're training somebody, this is going to sound stupid, Diana, I do apologize. Um, the green ones are universally used for the soap solutions or the detergent. The red buckets are universally used for the sanitizer. So the way that I get people to remember this is green is clean, red is dead. If it helps get your people to remember this. Um, the buckets cannot be stored on the floor. And the reason for this, when we put those, especially that red sanitizing bucket on the floor, it will pick up and be contaminated with all the, the floor junk. Often when we use the sanitizer, we pick it up and we put it on the cutting board or the prep table to then use it. Now all the gunk that's on the floor is now on your food contact surfaces. So you really wanna keep it off the floor. You also need to store it so it doesn't prevent, so it doesn't contaminate any of your food or equipment. So finding the right location for these buckets sometimes is really challenging. But once you find a place, identify it and make sure that everybody's familiar with it, the, the location. Um, high temp dish machine. So I am going to assume that probably um, I don't know, 75% of you probably have a high temp dish machine, maybe not. Um, high temp dish machines, the way that these work in order to sanitize. So sanitizing, um, we can do this by using high temperatures or we can sanitize by using chemicals. The way that I teach this in my surf safe classes is I'm, I'm thinking of all these little germs as little beings and you wanna kill these beings so you can fry the suckers using very hot water or you can poison them using a chemical. So in a high temp dish machine, the method that we use is hot water. In order for these machines to kill 99.999% of the germs, the water coming out of the manifold comes out at 180 degrees. 
by the time it gets down to the utensils. So the surface of the utensils, the dishes, the cutting board, it can drop by 20 degrees. You need to make sure that the water hitting the surfaces of everything that you're sanitizing is at least 160 degrees. This is a new code. And I put that here in writing. You are required to have an irreversible registering temperature indicator, say that twice, um, in order to confirm that your surface temperature is adequate. And I have two examples of what I've used here. Um, one of them, this is primarily what I was using. I'm gonna make this really big here. Um, what this is, is a little test strip. And I used to use this all the time. I would wrap it around um, a coffee cup handle. I would run it through the dish machine. If this little dark purple strip changed orange, that would indicate that my high temp dish machine was hot enough to kill the germs. I realized after going through hundreds of these, they were very expensive. So I ended up using these. And this is a cool little device. This is called a dish temp. And here's the on off button. When you turn this on and run it through your dish machine, this number on top will stay stuck to the highest temperature. So this one, um, you can see that's gone through the machine. It showed that the surface temperature was at least 162. So you can't calibrate the thermometers on your dish machine. So this is gonna be the way that you confirm that it's hot enough. So you are required to have these irreversible temperature devices. Um, low temp machines, I don't know what um, types of operations you guys represent. I am assuming some of you might have bars and that assumption, um, I will go with that assumption and assume you might have um, under the counter bar glass machines or low temp dish machines. If you do have these dish machines, they sanitize by using a chemical. So the, the chemical, I'm just going to say, follow the manufacturer's instructions, but the chemicals generally used is going to be chlorine. In the old days, people used iodine. I don't see that anymore, but most dish machines at this point, if they're low temps, are gonna be using chlorine. The water temperature is usually 120, and then you have to test the chemical concentration to confirm that you're getting sanitizer. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a bar and run glasses through the machine and put my little test strip in and had no chemical or color change. And then the people realized, oh, the bottle's been empty for a day, a week, a month, which means that they haven't been sanitizing at all. So anytime you're using a dish machine high temp, you can use that irreversible device. Low temp, you're going to be using um, some test strips. Um, I will quickly go through this. Um, two weeks from today, I am gonna show a video on proper procedures for using a three-base sink. All of you, I am assuming, have um, used a three-base sink at some point to wash and sanitize all of your equipment. Uh, to reiterate, and I forgot that people who are not trained don't know the proper procedures. About a week ago, I was in an establishment where this young kid, it was his first day, had zero training. He was washing things in the wash tank. He was doing a quick dip into the sanitizer tank, and then he would rinse them off and dry them with a dirty towel and put them up on the racks. So, um, as the PIC, I know probably all of you know how to do this, but what you don't realize is what people don't know. So don't make an assumption that just because the sink is set up in a linear way, that people know how to properly clean and sanitize. And um, it's also important to remember that your water temperature has to be hot. We have to have water at 110, which means we have to have a thermometer. If we have to have this tank at 110, we need to measure it. The sanitized tank, if you are using a chemical sanitizer, it probably has specific requirements. The food code will say 75. Um, so the water temperature of the sanitizer solution when you're using quats or chlorine has to be at least 75. So again, you need a thermometer. Um, another thing, one of the biggest mistakes that I see when it comes to sanitizing in a three-base sink is most sanitizers require a specific amount of contact time. That is the amount of the time that the surface has contact with the sanitizer. 
for chlorine, depending on the product, it might be seven seconds, 10 seconds. Um, for some products, it's 60 seconds or even up to two minutes. And the only way you're going to know the contact time is by reading the instructions on the bottle that you have. But one of the biggest mistakes that I see is people doing a quick wash, rinse, a very quick dip in the sanitized solution and then allow it to air dry. Um, I have a, a, a slide here just saying, test those solutions. Um, funny thing that I hear all of the time is, oh, we don't have to test our solutions because it's automatically dispensed. You will get a better, you, you will, if you are dispensing the chemicals yourself, you will know that it's at the proper concentration because if you are relying on a machine to put in the right amount and you're not testing it, how would you know the machine is empty? So I have people say, oh, I don't have to test it and I'll test it and there's zero concentration. And then I'll pick up their bottle and say, oh, but the bottle is empty. Oh, I had no idea because you weren't testing the chemical concentration. And another thing, when I say test those solutions, even if the bottle is full, and I'm sure you've seen this, sometimes the tube from the bottle to your dispenser might have air bubbles in it. Or I've seen little pinholes in it and it won't dispense properly. So even though you have an automatic dispenser, you need to make sure that you are testing the concentration every single time. The last thing I was going to talk about, and I'm leaving a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end, is the importance of um, dealing with allergies. Um, I am guessing that most of you are familiar with um, in 2011 Massachusetts passed the country's first allergy requirements, the allergy um, requirements in Massachusetts. There were actually three parts to this. Um, but about 10 years ago, Massachusetts passed the regulations that one, all of you have to be certified in Massachusetts allergy awareness. And I don't know, is this a question that you can answer, Diana, or is that too complicated this late in the game? No, I think people can just throw it in the chat if they're aware. Yeah, so um, the allergy, the Massachusetts Allergy Certification has a five-year expiration, just like the SurfSafe. I'm always telling people to do those at the same time, so they expire at the same time. Um, but you have to be allergy certified in Massachusetts, and it really goes through um, the, the eight most common allergens, talks about the symptoms, talks about what to do if somebody's having an allergic reaction. Um, but I always tell people that to treat these allergies or these allergens as poisons. Because for some people, although their um, reactions or symptoms might be mild to any of these proteins, and it could be mild like stomach upset, it could be um, developing hives, maybe having a slight tingling sensation. Um, for others, it could be complete, sudden anaphylaxis, not breathing and dead before anything can happen. So making sure that you and all of your employees are familiar with these allergies. And these are the eight most common allergens that are most common in the U.S. Uh, there's probably about 180 others, but these are the ones that are most common. So fish, I'm referring really to fin fish here. Shellfish, and this is interesting, we're really dealing with crustaceans. So crab or lobster and shrimp, not mollusks. Although that is a very common allergen, that is not one of the eight that's listed in the United States. Um, peanuts, which is very different than tree nuts. Peanuts is technically a legume. It's not grown in the tree. Um, eggs, oh, this should be milk. <laughs> eggs is a common one, milk, soy, and wheat. And I want to separate wheat from gluten. A lot of people don't realize that those are not necessarily the same thing. Wheat is very specific. Gluten includes wheat, but also includes barley and rye. And I recently went out, I cannot eat wheat. I cannot eat any gluten. I went out to a place recently and they said it was a gluten-free menu item and it had malt barley in the sauce. And for somebody to say it's gluten-free, even though it didn't have wheat, the malt, the barley is a, a gluten. So be very careful between using those terms interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. So wheat is one of the eight most common allergens. Elisa, um, I have a question yeah. too. Yes, if yes. Sesame will be added as an allergen. Yes, this will be added. And people are asking me when, and my answer is 
soon, but the answer soon is regulatory soon. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> Does that mean a month, a year? But sesame, sesame will be added. I recently looked it up and I don't have a definitive date on that. So, and if you go to other countries, you're gonna find a whole bunch of other um, items listed in your allergens. In some countries there's 10, there's 12, there's 14. So it, it's gonna be different um, if you're outside of the US. Um, I did leave some time um, for questions at the end. Um, I have pretty much gone through everything that I wanted to go over for tonight. Um, my intent for tonight was just looking at big picture, um, you know, talking about the basics, the TCS foods, the high risk populations, those big risk factors that you need to really focus on while you're working, um, and then the allergens. And then the next two sessions, I really want to kind of do more of a hands-on as much as you can do hands-on in a Zoom class and um, go into a lot more detail in terms of some of the requirements here. But I would like to, at this point, if um, we have any questions or wanted me to go over something in more detail, um, if you had comments, any statements, any experience, the experiences that you would wanna share with the group. And yeah, Diana, so I'm going to let you say if anyone wants to either raise their hand or unmute, because I feel like everyone's muted at this point. So I think raising the hand first would be helpful, or you can throw your question in the chat and I can ask it. So we have one question from Marsha Joan. Is the JSI allergen training acceptable? Um, that is not. There's a lot of different allergy trainings that are out there that um, I almost don't want to say this out loud, but I'm going to, that might be a little more current. Um, but the only one that's approved in Massachusetts right now is the Massachusetts allergy training. And there's um, a couple of different um, people that I refer people to when they need the training. It's just a, a 30 minute video, you're 10 bucks and you get the certificate. Um, Serve Safe has the Massachusetts allergy video on their website. And Berkshire AHEC also will provide the certificate for the allergy training. It does not require an exam. And I also included the link, the mass.gov link in the chat that will take you directly okay. for that allergy training. So Excellent. it's in the chat right now. So we got another question. So it's the temperature of the sanitizer bay from the three bay sink. Does it have to be 75 degrees at all times? It should. Um, what I do find is a lot of times it's being dispensed really, really high. And if you look at the dispensing um, or the, the, the paper dispenser, it will say should be between like 65 and 75 degrees. If it's really, really high, it would eventually come down to room temperature, but we don't get an accurate reading when the water solution is too high. Um, Eventually, though, if, if it does mix higher, if it's really cold when you mix it and it's sitting out for an hour, it will adjust to the room temperature, which is what, 70, 75 degrees. Great. Does anyone else have any other questions? Trying to see if there's any raised hands, but I don't see. Okay. So will the dish temp device, so that plate simulating device, does it work well for measuring the minimum temperature that does not fall below so like checking the minimum temperature it's really a maximum reader so that top number is only going to show the highest temperature so it would work if you're running it through a low temp dish machine and you're looking for that 120 it will say 120 130 whatever it is um, but just to point out for a low temp dish machine the critical component is that you have the proper chemical concentration so it's your low temp machines. I don't even use a dish temp. I'll, I'll do the reading from the actual machine. And then I will test the solution with my chlorine, it's usually chlorine, um, my chlorine test strip to make sure that it's at the concentration. And the bottles, most bottles for machines um, say it should be about a hundred ish. Most bottles, if you're mixing chlorine in a bucket or in a three base sink, they often will say mix to 200 parts per million. And then when it dilutes to a hundred, remix it. Next, I actually see this question. Should all servers be directed to ask about allergies at the table? I would say that's best practices. Um, I think it's a great idea, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't make it mandatory for those people who truly have um, allergies, especially if they're life-threatening life or serious, we'll bring this up. Um, 
I like to be asked. It makes me feel comfortable when I walk into a place, say, are there any, you know, dietary restrictions? Do you have an allergy? Anything that we need to be aware of? Because it makes me comfortable that the server is conscientious about the allergens. That's a good question. What else? Like I said, if someone wants to ask it, they can unmute themselves. I believe you're able to do that. It's a Monday. It's a quiet group. <laughs> it's also hard on Zoom, I think, to get personal with people and, and comfortable asking questions. But you can be anonymous asking if you want to do it into the chat. Where do you purchase the disc uh, dish temp disc? It's through ThermoWorks. You probably are familiar with that. And I usually have my bag with me. Yeah, ThermoWorks has some of those. Um, the problem with those, um, they those themselves cannot be calibrated. I, I Mine is close within three or four degrees. Um, they do also have thermometers that are um, will also register the high temperature that you can run through machines as well. But I, I, that is my preference to use. It. It's easy to use. I don't lose it. Just throw it in a machine. Every time, it seems like every other inspection I do, the chef's like, oh, that's the coolest thing. Can I buy it from you? And they buy it from me and I buy it. So now I bought a dozen of them because I keep giving them out to people when I'm in classes because it's a cool little thing. But you have to hide it because it's cool. People will steal it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Antonio, for putting the, the link in the chat. And then there's another question. Is there a specific range for the sanitizer strength when testing the solution? It depends on the chemical. Um, I'm going to talk about quats first. The most, in my opinion, and this could be just me being a consultant and not seeing every type of food service establishment, the most commonly used now is probably quats. Um, quaternary ammonium compounds. There's a bunch of different companies. When I first started working, there was only one. It was always 200 parts per million. Now, oh, um, Ecolab has a product called Oasis 146. The range on that one is 150 to 400. I tell people to mix it around three or 400 because every hour it will dilute by about 50%. Um, other chemicals that I've seen for the quads is like two to 400. And for chlorine, um, if you look at the food code, it really varies on the water temperature, the pH levels of the water, the water hardness. So to answer that one in a, with a black and white statement is difficult, but I'm going to say general rule of thumb. A lot of the, con the instructions on the bottle will say mix to 200 and then remix or refill the bucket when it starts to dilute below 100. Uh, chlorine, um, it used to be used so common. It was probably more common because it was cheap, but um, it's corrosive to metals. And um, my old inspection clothes, I always had like a line of white because I bleached my clothes leaning up against the sink. So, so many people now use quads. Long answer to short question. I do apologize. What else? It almost looked like Charles was going to ask a question and I was anticipating it and he did not. Oh, no. <laughs> Anybody else? And I'm looking at other faces on here now. Yeah, I was going to say, if anyone has questions afterwards that they think of, of, you can email me and I'll pass it on to Lisa and we can answer those questions in the coming weeks or we'll email you back if it's very specific. I did send Diana um, a copy of tonight's slides in um, like handout mode if anybody wants a copy of that. It's in color so if you printed it it's going to go through all your ink very quickly but um, she does have a copy of that if anybody's interested and I will do that the next two weeks as well as I'll just have a printed um, handout from that night's presentation and um, you know if you have any questions about it that you think of you could ask Diana or you could send me an email that would be fine as well yeah. and also I'm um, sure you guys realized when you came in to the meeting that it was being recorded I think I had a little bit of a glitch in the middle so we might have lost a couple seconds but we'll make it work and it's possible that some faces might show up but I'll see if I can work on taking those out <laughs> 
few little glitches no matter learning. how much you practice little dog barking slides got frozen okay. <laughs> it's the covid world we're used to now <laughs> well very good i i think unless you had anything else diana this is this is a good beginning the next two will probably go um right to about 6 30 today went to 6 15 so we'll probably be a few minutes longer but i promise i will not keep anybody longer than the time we had dedicated to this because your your time is important your time is valuable and i don't want to take up your time yep and we'll probably have a little bit more interaction now that i know how to do polls and everything <laughs> for, excited for everybody <laughs> so we'll work on that for next week but again same time same place next week looking forward to seeing same faces, new faces. I'm really happy with the turnout. So I appreciate every single one of you for taking the time out of your schedule to watch this presentation. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to email me at any point. Uh, but we'll see you guys same time, same place next week. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'll stop recording.